But you know, as a church, we've been studying out the book of Philippians, seeing the themes that are in this book and just looking at it uh, piece by piece. And so today, I just want to share a little bit of what we're taking away as a church all together. And so I've entitled the sermon, A Love That Abounds. A Love That Abounds. We'll read Philippians 1, chapter um, 1, verses 1 through 11. All right, a lot of ones there. So we'll focus in on uh, those verses. So we'll read it all together. So please be turning your Bibles. I don't have the entire thing on one slide. But after we read it all, we'll come back and dissect it bit by bit. So, Philippians 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. From the first day, until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion into the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending the, and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless into the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. You know, if you're alive here this morning, you know that life has its fair shares of setbacks, disappointments, heartbreaks, tears. We know that life is like that. And the reason Philippians matters is that if we read this honestly, what you will see in Paul's letter to the church in Philippi are setbacks, persecutions, threats, Divisions in the community, tensions in the families. And what you're going to be hearing from is from a follower of Jesus named Paul who's writing this letter in jail. He is in house arrest. And you know, we've all gone through our fair share of it all. And yet this church and its leaders, what makes this so surprising is their response to it all. And this is why Philippians matters. So let's go to verse 1 and read again. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, did you catch how many times Christ Jesus was used in these verses? At first, it could come across a little redundant. Or perhaps... Paul is trying to be intentional to remind himself, remind the church that the relationships they have here, that Jesus is the center of the church. Amen. That there are some things that it's just good to be redundant about. Some things we just can't get tired of repeating or saying. There are many things. You know, you can think of, you know, man, when Jesus tells his people that I will be with you to the very end of the age. When he gives them a great commission to go and make disciples of all nations. Or when the Bible speaks to us about fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There are many things, but I pray that this right here, what you will hear, this phrase that God loves you, is what you will hear every time you come in worship of Him. We can talk about many things, and we will as a church, right? But I hope that you will hear it loud and clear that God loves you. It's why we're here. I hope you hear it in the fellowship. I hope you hear it in the worship, through communion. I hope you hear it regularly that God loves loves you because there are just some things we can't become redundant about. Amen. Verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you and in all my prayers for all of you 
I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first time until now. You know, what was that first day? How did the church get started? Well, I just want to remind us real quickly about Acts 16 and Paul's adventure in starting the church. You know, he was getting blocked. There was opposition for him to go to Asia Minor. And God gave him a vision, a picture of a man from Macedonia asking Paul to come over and help him. You know, I knew very little about Macedonia until I met a young man by the name of Boro Isailovsky. I was a teen disciple sharing my faith out in the Third Street Promenade here in L.A., and the sisters got a hold of this skateboarding, European-looking dude, and he came out to devotional. I'll never forget his first time there, you know, greeting people, saying hi, and he comes up to me, and he's like, hey, man, do you have a smoke? You know, can you imagine a teen coming into your midst and going, hey, guys, who has a smoke around here? And I was kind of taken back, but again, he was European, so I was like, oh, okay, well, I don't know what kind of church you think this is, man, but uh, no, no, we, we don't smoke here, man. He's like, oh, okay, that's okay. But, you know, he kept coming around, and, and the word was spoken to him. He fell in love with God and became your brother in Christ. He then turns around and shares his faith at his high school, and there he meets Gary Santos. And Gary comes out and becomes a disciple. I got to witness these guys become Christians. And you know, he taught me a lot about Macedonia. So nonetheless, Paul's former plans had changed. Paul's off to preach the gospel. And even though he saw a man in the vision, it was a woman named Lydia who God used to begin the church there. So shout out to the sisters that God used them, uh, her and her household, to start the church there in Philippi. And we also know about this young woman who was possessed by a demonic spirit telling the future, and she was being exploited by men for profit. And, uh, you know, she didn't convert right away, but she starts to follow Paul, and everywhere she goes, she's just like cheerleading for these guys, saying, hey, these guys are servants of the Most High God. They know the way to be saved, right? And so Paul at first is thinking, okay, this is kind of a little annoying here, you know, having this cheerleader over here. But, you know, what if there's any message that I could have any neon sign over my head that's not a bad one to have right servants of the most high uh, we know the way to be saved but you know after a while you know even after a while of listening to your favorite song you just gotta hit shuffle right <laughs> I, I mean you know unless you're my two-year-old son who dearly misses all things Christmas and he's still singing around the house you're a bad banana with a doom, doom, greasy black peel. Da, na, 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 na. You know, he's like seeing the Grinch, you know? He just can't stop singing it. And don't get me wrong, it was cute the first 875 times. <laughs> but there's only so much a man can take. And so Paul exercises the demon and brings her to relief as well. And then the Roman jailer falls before Paul, and after hearing Paul and Silas singing to their God all night, despite being flogged and beaten and thrown into uh, jail without trial, wrongfully mistreated as Paul was a Roman citizen, the jailer's moved. He's so moved, and he asks, what do I need to do to be saved? They are having impact in the midst of trials. Their dominant thought is that God is faithful. You know, what's your spiritual thought coming into 2020 this year? Whether you're just surviving, whether you just survived 2019, whether you're, you know, you thrived in 2019, what's your spiritual dominant thought for this year? Because the battle of our faith, the battle of our faith for 2020 is won or lost right here. It's in our minds. It's what we pay attention to, what we contemplate. Are we listening to his truths? Are we being dominated by spiritual promises that he gives to us? Because if we are, that's what will win. What you think about is a reflection of who you are, and it has the potential to inspire, impact others. You know, I heard that Reuben got you guys to, some goggles there so you could see the world, see the lenses through God's eyes. That's great. That's incredible. Because it's important to see things, uh, the spiritual battle that we're in. 
And so you look at Paul and he has this spiritual optimism, this spiritual faith like no other. It's that kind of faith that changes households as he changed Lydia and her household. It changes cities. It changes churches from being inward focused to outward focus. That's this kind of faith. And, you know, we got to think about our God in that way. He's huge. He's mighty. He's loving. He's forgiving. And he's always at work in the good of those who love him. Man. So Paul and the Philippians, these guys, they were close. They've, they've given a lot to each other. They made a difference with each other. Jesus was the center of their relationship. It just, these are people he knew, people he converted, people he loved. It was such an intimate letter from which the church started. Um, you know, that he wrote about 10 or 12 years later. So in verse 5, with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul saw the beginning and their growth over the last decade or so, but he's thinking to himself and he's communicating to them, you haven't seen nothing yet. That where you're going, that God has a vision for you. God has plans for you. And if you're here this morning, God would want you to hear that. You may feel like you've maxed out. You've hit a ceiling. But here, God's word says, I have a plan for you. I have visions for you. I began a work and I want to complete it in you. Where you are heading, the trajectory of your maturity is something to look forward to. Man. Because it's God-initiated. It's God-driven. And it will be God-completed. You know, in the same spirit as Paul is just reflecting with, with their church and, and, and the people he knew, I just can't help but reflect a little bit of just God initiating and God driving Addie and I to move from L.A. to Dallas. And, you know, we were just newlyweds. We were so wet behind the ears. I mean, we were, you know, as you could say, uh, you know, we were a joy to disciple. You could just ask the Deondas, our first year of marriage. But I followed Ruben to an international leadership conference where all our leaders across uh, our movement gathered together uh, in Miami, Florida. And I saved up our pennies. I went and there they were having this meet and greet session for those who were looking for ministry and those who were looking to get hired to be uh, in the full-time ministry. And I just told myself, you know, now's not really the time. I'm not, I'm not even with my wife here. You know, these guys are more serious. I don't have anything. I'm just hanging out. I'm just a fly in the wall. But then I thought, well, just be a fly in the wall. Just go see what's happening, right? What could happen? So I went, and it was starting off very informal. You know, people were saying hi, introducing themselves. But then someone grabbed the mic and told people to come to the front and take a seat because we're going to have some formal introductions. You're going to get to announce yourself, let people know where you're from, your experience, and what you're looking for to hire or be hired. I thought, oh, no, what am, I, what am I doing here? You know, I had one of those want to get away moments, you know, but I was, I was kind of near the front, so I kind of just like back away slowly into, you know, the, the exit door. So I stayed, and people just started passing the mic, introducing themselves, and it came to me, and I grabbed the mic. And then there I was. My name is Will Garcia. I'm from the L.A. church. And literally, as I just said those words, the power in that room went out. Just complete darkness. I thought, sweet, you know, like, okay, great. Here, next, you, you talk, man. I'm done, you know. Nobody needs to know me. I'm just a fly on the wall here. But then I hear this voice in the darkness. Bro, we can still hear you. I thought, man, okay, I'm doing this in the dark. All right, so uh, here we go. I introduced myself, everything, and then, you know, pass the mic, and then all of a sudden the lights kick back on, right? Talking about trying not to make an impression, Derek Vett, our regional leader who met me that day, comes over and he's like, hey, uh, aren't you the, the guy that spoke in the dark? Aren't you that speaking in the dark guy? I thought, okay, this is a little bit better than the, you know, fire guy or the crossword puzzle guy, right? You know, I was like, I'm the guy who talked in the dark guy. But that meeting right there would lead to something special. 
You know, we came back. We were talking to the Andas. They were talking to the Andas. We were like, what's going on? What's happening? God may be calling you here. And so we went, and we, we met the church, and literally two months later, with their blessing and with, with their faith in us, we decided to take a leap of faith and to go to Dallas. We were quitting our jobs, saying goodbye to our families. That was literally almost 10 years ago. And, you know, I wonder all that Paul was thinking, all that Paul was going through in his mind as he thought about the church that was there. And in verse 7, he's like, it's right for me to feel this way about all of you. Since I have you in my heart, whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you sharing God, God's grace with me, and God can testify how, long, how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. That this is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. So I, wanna, I just want to camp out on this phrase here. The, your love may abound more and more, super overflowing, happening all the more in knowledge, in depth and insight, so you could discern. Now, the notion of discernment has to do more with, you know, discriminating. Discriminating between what is counterfeit and what is real, uh, what is best and what is better, what is true, what is false. That's what that notion is, to grow in your knowledge of this, to grow in your insight, but it's not just to know more. It's not just to fill your head up with more, but that you can be pure and blameless. And, and why this is important, well, remember, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13, which is all about love. So yes, he's, he's really laying in on these guys that, hey, you got to learn. You got to be more knowledgeable. You got to have insight and discernment. But in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, he's talking about love. And he's like, if I fathom all the mysteries and knowledge, but have not loved, I'm nothing. You know, in other words, it's like, you know, if we've learned the Bible so well, we, can, we have all these great insights and we can piece the puzzle together and put it all nice and, you know, but it does not result in selfless service to others. Paul would say, then it's nothing. And so because they have this basis here, they have this track record of being loving, and, and he's thanking them for their love. I mean, you know, he's like, man, I, I, I appreciate your love. I'm, I'm saying this because I know you're very loving, but he goes, I want you to take it even higher. I want you to go deeper in your love. Amen. And so here's my prayer for you, that where you're at right now, for you to take it deeper, you need to determine that your life is not about you. I hope you've determined that it's not about you. If you've not yet denied yourself, then how do we even take the first step to walking with Christ? You want to walk with Christ? We absolutely need to learn how to deny ourselves. Jesus himself, completely selfless. In chapter 2, it's all about Christ, all about his humility and imitating that. Because if we don't have this senseless, uh, selfless uh, love, then, you know, we won't have the hope of knowing true Christian agape love. Every sense of that word, yeah. the selfless service to others. Yeah. And if that's not the case for you right now, then now's a good time than any to see God wanting to do that in your life. For you to have the depths of that kind of love exude from your life so that you can be filled by it, so then you can be poured out and reciprocated at every turn to those around us. It's the kind of lives that God graciously allows us to live. To see his grace come full circle over and over again. You know, coming full circle, you know, this past Christmas, I got to spend my birthday uh, here in L.A., and I gathered my friends, and I gathered a very dear friend of mine. Uh, his name's Owen, and, and he's in the South Bay, and he was my mentor. He revealed Christ to me as a young man. He modeled what being a disciple is like. 
He helped me to become a Christian. And so there we were talking and sharing stories and, and yapping it up, having a lot of fun with that. But what made it so special was that right next to him was his 14-year-old son. And, you know, I was 14 when he was studying the Bible with me, when he was teaching me about Christ. And so to think about his son now is sitting right next to us. He's hearing the stories and the, and the spiritual effects that one has when, they, when they're willing to deny themselves and help others to become great. It, it did something for him. You know, we were walking out, and he was like, man, you know, I didn't know these stories about you, Dad. I didn't know my dad was pretty cool, Will. I was like, yeah, man, your dad's pretty cool. You know, I came back to Dallas, and uh, I got a text from one of our former teens uh, that uh, helps out with the campus ministry in, in Pepperdine and, and UCLA. And he said, hey, you know, there was a, a brother that just got converted, and he's going home for the holidays. He's from Plano, Texas. You know, that's like 10 minutes away from me. And he said, hey, could you get in touch with him? You went to Pepperdine. He's from Dallas. You know, I just thought it would be a nice mix, uh, a match, you know. And so I was like, Sure. So I text him up. I'm like, hey, let's meet up. Let's go to Chick-fil-A. Uh, I'll be wearing my Pepperdine gear. You should wear your Pepperdine sweater. He's like, yeah, that sounds great, but I don't have a Pepperdine sweater. I'm like, you're killing me, Smalls. Uh, and so we go. And after a few minutes of just connecting with him, we just bonded. We're just telling our stories, how we became Christians. And, you know, he told me about his upbringing and just being religious. And, you know, I grew up in church, but I didn't grow up in Christ. I wasn't held to the standard. I wasn't following his standard. I didn't repent. Just incredible story of this young man who came to that realization. And then I was sharing with him my story as a, as a teenager in El Segundo, being baptized there, trying to do something great for God there from a single family home as well. I just just trying to encourage him and telling him how me and this Macedonian went to Pepperdine to launch the campus ministry there. And then it clicked. He said, man, because you went to Pepperdine back in 2001, somehow you going to Pepperdine somehow impacted me in 2019. I said, yeah, but, but here's the thing. It's your turn to keep it going. You have an opportunity to keep the grace going. And that's what Paul is trying to get at with these guys. He's trying to teach them, guys, keep this going. Keep the dance of grace going going. Don't let it sit on your lap, but pass it on. Let's give it away. Amen. And Paul was really encouraged. He, he was loving his guys. He was trying to encourage them that what I want for you guys is to press forward, to dream bigger, that Jesus is coming back. We're all going somewhere, guys. This is leading us to somewhere. And so there's this mutual reciprocation of, of grace Jesus to Paul, Paul to the Philippians, Philippians from Jesus to the hurting world. And it's all beautiful. It's all being reinforced. And, you know, once you get it, you just can't wait to give it away. You can't wait to give it back. Yeah. And that's the reality of these relationships in this church. Not only has he begun a good work in you, but he will bring it to completion. Amen. Well, how will he do that? How will he complete this work? Well, God will complete a love in you. That's what's going to grow, our love. An agape love. And, and just to not give this, you know, this service here, I don't want you to think of an overused, uh, you know, sentimental feeling kind of cheesy hallmark love. I want you to really understand the meaning that Paul is going after right here. When Jesus shows this abounding love, I want you to think John 13. I want you to think how he showed his love to the fullest. He humbles himself. Yep. A towel around his waist. He grabs a bowl of water and he begins to wash the feet of 12 dull men who are astounded by this man's example. That's love. It's a selfless service to others. Yes, it's attended with real affection, but there's real clarity it's obvious. It's clear. You can see it. Yep. And that's what he was trying to get at. He's trying to encourage them to do all the more. I mean, he realizes that one of the brothers came and sent him a gift. He almost died trying to give him this gift to him. And so it could have been so tempting for him to say, hey, 
man, I know you guys are very loving. I know your love is, is great and it's there in your relationships. I get it. I'm going to go teach the other churches and tell them that they need to be more like you. No, he doesn't do that. Instead, he goes, you know what? Um, I, I want you to know, don't settle here. Don't settle for where you're at. And no matter where we are in our walk with God, Paul will want us to have this idea of progression, of moving forward, of growing in growth as we become more and more like Christ. As a community, doing it together, individually in our own walks with God, but, but, but we're growing, we're abounding, we're super abounding all the more in our selfless service as we become more like Jesus. You know, the whole world is thinking about progress right now. Yes, it's, you know, 26 days or so into the new year, but people are talking about progress, about moving forward and the changes they got to make to better their lives or to make it better. How much more for the disciples of Jesus, for us to have spiritual progressive goals, goals that will lead us to progression in our lives this year and really into the new decade so what spiritual progress will you be intentional about making this year? Maybe it's just simply to love our God, love our spouses, love our children, our family, love our friends, I mean, love ourselves. Maybe it's truly to know Christ like you've never known Him before. You know, last week before I came here, it was raining. And, you know, Texas weather is kind of bipolar. It's like, you know, freeze one night. The next day I'm out playing disc golf because it's 65. I mean, it's just kind of crazy like that. But it was raining. And you ever seen people wrestle with umbrellas? You know, they're trying to get it open and they're trying to stay dry. And sometimes, you know, this lame umbrella just doesn't open quick enough or the way they want it to. And so they start to get wet a little bit. And especially true with children, right? You know, they begin trying to stay dry, but then they begin to, you know, get wet. And there's this miserable dance of like, ah, oh, how can I just like stop from being wet? How can I stay dry? And, you know, at some point, they just give up on the umbrella. They're like, you know what? You know, forget this. I'm going all in. Okay, goodbye umbrella. Hello, rain. And suddenly, this kid is like the happiest kid on the block. They're jumping into puddles. They're singing in the rain. They're like drinking the rain or whatever. They're just so excited because what was once a miserable thing ends up becoming this beautiful, wondrous adventure. And I think we can be the same way in Christ. Let's say Jesus wants to, he's trying to get us baptized. He's trying to help us be reconciled to him. He's trying to help us get uh, when become a faithful disciple of his. But maybe we're uncomfortable with that. We, you know, walking with Jesus, I'm not sure. You know, I, I want to stay dry. I, I like it there. It's a little bit safer. But, you know, if you were to just abandon any self-preservation, just let go and let God just do his work, you would understand, you would know the unrestrained joy that Paul knew, and that the Philippians knew. You know, Jesus isn't trying to get you to deny yourself so that he could put shackles on you, right? You know, like, ah, oh, got you. All right, yeah, you're going to be mowing the church lawn the rest of your life. <laughs> you know, he's not trying to do that. You know, I got you, sucker. You know, he's, that's not his game plan. True scripture, uh, scriptures never speak of that. And so never should the life of a disciple look that way. You guys want to understand what I'm saying? When Jesus calls us to deny ourselves, right, and ask for terms of peace, we don't become his prisoner. We become a mighty warrior on his team. But sometimes we come across like prisoners. Man, I got to read my Bible how many times? I got to pray how many times? I, I got to give how much? I got to do what how many times? That's a prisoner. Bible speaks nothing of that. We are warriors of his kingdom. You know, Jesus, when we do that, when we're, when we're just like abandoning that, man, so comes the joy 
that isn't based on circumstances. You know, here's just a, a few pictures of some of our teens who became Christians last year. And, you know, as a team ministry, we always got to stay focused uh, our focus on our communities, right? On those who haven't grown up in the church, who don't have what our kids who are growing up in church have had all their life. And so here are three kids, three teens who were baptized last year who didn't grow up in the church. Uh, the first one is uh, Jada. Oh, sorry, he jumped ahead there. There's Jada. Uh, Jada was reached out to at a pool party. Her and her family came out. Jada continued to study the Bible. She loved the Bible. So she loved falling in love with God. She became your sister this past year. But you know, it hasn't been easy for her. Her family is just persecuting her. You know, her sister is a teenage mom, and her mom goes in and out of relationships, and, and you know, she's trying to bring them to God. But they're like, hey, don't talk about God. You can do what you want, uh, but we're not going to help you. You need to find your ride. You need to find your way. We're not going to pay for anything. The church is loving her. She is holding on to her faith. She's like, I just want to, man, I just want to graduate. I want to help you become Christians, but I need help. And the church has loved up on her, and she's continuing in her walk with God. You know, the next person here is Action Jackson here. Uh, he's a cross-country runner at his high school, reached out to, and uh, he came out. He'd grown up in church, but he came to one of our midweeks and said, hey, man, how'd you like it? He said, dude, I'm coming to your midweeks now. I said, Okay, great. You know, so we began studying the Bible, and he just unraveled so much of religiosity that's there in, in, in you know, the, the Southern Belt, you know, the Bible Belt there in Texas, and he, he just came to really appreciate what the Bible says about his, the, his plan of salvation, about truly being a Christian. And so now he's your brother in Christ, and he runs now for God. And lastly, here's Erica. Uh, Erica was reached out to by teen disciple, a quiet, shy teen disciple who knows to, to make disciples, who knows that she's got to be a bright light. And all she did was just make sure that she stood above the temptation, stood above when everyone's going this way, she's going that way. And someone took notice, and it was Erica. She said, hey, I, I heard about your church group. I want to go. I want to visit. She came, and she was hurting because her father just passed away a, a couple months before they met her. And she says, I have answers. I don't want to blame God, but I have, ans I have questions. And I know I can find answers in the Bible, but I need help. So we got together with her, and she became your, uh, your sister in Christ just last year. And so, guys, you know, teen disciples, I mean, hear me. I've been in your shoes. I know what it's like. I want to encourage you to hang on, to persevere. Don't listen to the crowd when everyone else is going with the crowd. You follow the cloud. Amen? Amen? So, you know, Paul's talking about this selfless love. And when we really decide to take on this selfless love that, man, I'm not going to be perpetually immature in my walk with Christ. I'm not just going to keep having spiritual birthdays and act like I'm maturing in faith, right? You know what I'm saying, guys? Uh, we're talking about, man, I need to add to my knowledge, goodness, and, and keep adding because there's somewhere I was meant to be. I need to be more like Jesus. I need to press on towards the goal. And so this is what I love about the church, that we're, we're in discipling relationships. We need each other. We don't know how high really is. And so we have people in our lives calling us to Christ. But here's the thing. No one is more responsible for my walk with God than me. I'm not independent. I'm not saying, you know, hey, I don't need you guys. But I'm not codependent. I'm not, you know, needing you to tell me what to do, what not to do. I am interdependent with my brothers and sisters. Because they will help me to be called higher to my potential. And we need each other so that you as well can grow to your potential here in 2020. I love that about our church. And everyone that's come out to our church that grew up in, some, in another church or another, that's what they say about us, guys. They see it. And I know sometimes because we've been in it so long, we forget how special that is. We take it for granted. I want to encourage you to show your appreciation for who you have in your life. And what a wonderful place to end up, right? Getting excited about being pure and blameless, right? Pure really meaning that, you know, you're the same in public as you are in private, right? You're not, you're not playing church. You're not faking the funk, right? You're just being yourself. What a great thing. What, what, what a mark of maturity. And Jesus wants us all to be there. 
Paul wants the Philippian church to be there. And that's where we can all go if we take these things to heart. So as we bring this in for landing here and prepare to take the Lord's Supper, John 13, there's three words that stood out to me as I read this. It says, The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he'd come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He got up. The king got up. You know, prideful people don't get up and do things. Prideful people, they want things done for them. Prideful people don't get up or maybe only get up when it serves them, when it's in their best interest. Jesus got up and washed his disciples' feet. You know, if you've been sitting on your potential as a servant in the kingdom of God, it's time to get up in 2020. Jesus wants you and I to get up like he did, helping others to become great. There are college students, there are singles, there are marrieds, there are teens to help become great this year. But if we're really going to get up, we also need to learn how to heal, uh, kneel as Jesus did. He washed his disciples' feet. And Jesus is the living and exalted proof that in bowing, in kneeling, we too can stand like him. Let's go to God as we pray for the Lord's Supper. Father, thank you so much for this time together. We get to commune with one another. We get to reflect and think about your son. Thank you for the example that we have before us here as the Philippians, the book of Philippians continues to really show and highlight Jesus' humility. Jesus' love that was given to Paul and therefore then Paul gave it to the church in Philippi and all he came into contact. Father, thank you for the way that you forgive us. Thank you for the way that you watch over us and you wash our sins and you give us opportunities to grow, to be forgiven, to change it, to become anew. I pray, Father, that you would help us to do that here in this year, that we'd focus on progressing in one thing, but that we would be adamant about that one thing, that we'd be serious about that one thing. Father, we need you, absolutely, to do that. So thank you for your son, Jesus, who makes all of this possible. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen.